Awesome. Thank you, N and Kim and Wonder Community. Um, I have heard again and again complaints about onboarding. It is a, a big pain point in um, DAOs, and so I want to do a brain dump on you guys and jam together on uh, what I've learned this past year, specifically the past four months, uh, building an onboarding system with the team at Orca. And we're going to kind of start at a 30,000 foot level, then zoom down to some actionable items. I promise there are lots of actionable items in here. And feel free to shoot any questions up. Um, if um, I'm, I'm not going to be able to see the chat, but if uh, Kim or N, if y'all are keeping your eye on the chat, please uh, voice any questions to me. And I will, uh, I'll do my best with that. And let's see, let me, can everyone see? my screen and does it look full screen with the workshop fantastic okay <clears throat> uh, so onboarding all about helping new members become engaged and committed contributors how do we help these people find their way and i want to again thirty thousand foot view let's back up and talk about what you know what is the value proposition of onboarding and to a greater extent of community why you know the value of a community is really based on on the people. It's just a group of people. And that sounds obvious, but that's not how um, community is often treated. So I want to call it out because each person is, is more than their demographics, right? They're bringing uh, their ideas, their skills, their relationships, and whatever time uh, that they can invest in, in your project. And, and then also their passions, which might have nothing to do with the work at hand, but uh, can in the future create a tangent opportunity and all of these things combined together equals you know the projects the investments the clients the partnerships and this this is the value of a of a of a DAO of a community and so really right now um, this value is not getting realized or it's getting lost either because the the engagement isn't there the people leave or the information isn't collected and at hand when we need it in so many ways and those are the things that that we're going to address any questions on value proposition uh, it seems like john we if i john john if i may yes. may i uh what is okay i understand the philosophy the, the first principles that you mentioned and i say hooray but what is the central purpose if it was just one thing is it is it okay to ask? Uh, the simple purpose of community or of onboarding? Of of the wonder was I I just came today. This is my first call. I am absolutely oh, okay. sorry. I do not have okay. any context. I saw your okay. tweet and was curious and came and came on board. So I am Excellent. so sorry. I shouldn't have asked that question. No, 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 you're great. Uh, so we're going to focus on onboarding since this is a workshop, but then um, uh, you know, there's a lot of resources to learn about Wonder, which is a project management. Well, it's gosh, it's so much more than that now. Uh, it's really a, a, a central central tool for DAOs, and, and we can uh, I can hand you off to N after the workshop, and uh, and you'll you'll get. So uh, I'm so sorry. I'll come back later. Don't. Just forget what I asked. I'll find. I'll <laughs> no, you're great. I'm this sorry. Is, this is part of community. We're taking care of everybody, and I love it. Um, so. Objectives of onboarding are like orientation, like literally like giving them a map and helping them find their way around. Um, education, that can mean a lot of things. It can be about the product. It can also be about helping them uh, up their skills. Uh, relationship building within, within the organization and um, getting some early participation and early success really helps with retention. So that participation uh, objective and then Profile building. This one is a little contentious, and we can we'll talk about it more when we um, uh, on future slides. But um, gathering data about your members um, is is part of being able to capture this value. And and instead of doing it in an exploitive way, we're doing it to help them. We're trying to help them maximize their value and their contribution. So this is. Um, what I have for onboarding objectives. Can anyone else think of something that um, that they have been using or that they would like to add to this? Um, so 
one last like philosophical slide, like there's some big questions that every organization needs to ask. Who do you want in your community? Um, just you know, opening the doors and saying everybody come in uh, is fine, but you're also going to get this like um, these these constant tensions unless you have. Um, it's just going to be harder to to get everybody working in one direction on one purpose, uh, and so thinking who do you want in your community? There's going to be a lot of different stakeholders, and um, just kind of narrowing it down in your in your mind helps. Uh, designing these systems uh, so that uh, if you want square pegs, square pegs will come in and round pegs, you know, may not. And um, I guess that's a strange metaphor, but I had, I had in my head this like little, you know, little hole in a, a little shaped door and everybody coming in. Uh, what do you want them to do? Uh, again, an obvious question, but for each of those stakeholders, you should have in mind uh, a different sort of a different path uh, of, of what sort of engagement you want them to have. And then how hard should it be to join? This is a big one because um, I've seen really open communities, tons of people. I know um, that's kind of how Wonderverse started was just like, come on, everybody, we're talking about DAOs. And if you have any interest in Web3, let's uh, let's get in here and jam on it. And it, it kind of suited that purpose of having a lot of people talking about uh, the Web3 journey together. Um, but you might have a very focused um, DAO. Maybe there's not a lot of work to do. Uh, in Orca, we had um, a pretty high hurdle for people to join because we actually didn't need a lot of contributors. What we needed were high quality contributors. And, um, and so the, the process that I helped uh, build and implement over there was designed to uh, really invest more per person and um, you know it's expensive to run those things. We can talk a little bit more about that when we get to it. But these are the three questions that'll help you um, get a grasp on on what direction to go when designing your onboarding system. And so here's the tactical stuff. Here's sort of the 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 overall flow. Pretty common. Um, usually there's some profile questions, and then uh, the Discord is structured so that there's like a start here. Um, and and the, the Wonder Discord is awesome that way, so you can use that as an example. Um, and, you know, optional educational flows. Um, I extend that into, like, community calls and office hours. That's part of onboarding. That is often the first human contact that anyone has, so that's important. Uh, and then cohort or one-on-one -on -one calls, again, for um, high-value contributors, because that does require a, a lot of... Uh, people power to pull those off. And then matchmaking. Um, you can kind of consider that the last step of onboarding is actually like connecting people to people, people to projects, um, encouraging them to write proposals if if they don't, if there's not already a project they want to connect with. So we're going to go through each of these uh, in depth. So Profile question. So yeah, I mentioned this being a little bit contentious about how much data you should keep on members and how that data should be stored and used. Um, if you have a basic, you know, database you can set up in Clarity or, or Notion, uh, you know, I, I always promote Clarity because that's our sort of Web3 native uh, solution. Uh, if you have a database with the typical demographic information, um, you can just have like a big searchable field. And if people are posting intros in the intro channel, as we like them to do, that's also um, information that can be dropped in here. You would also use um, uh, the cohort onboarding. You know, you're interacting with people. That's a good way to gather some data. Um, and instead of like hitting people with a big profile here, fill this out to be a contributor all at once, um, using really pretty forms like Typefully or something, or, uh, or Typeform, Typefully is the other the Twitter thing. I, I made a mistake. I'll fix that. Um, but like type form or something, it's really just collecting the minimal amount of data so you don't overwhelm people. But you can do that like every week. You can, you can use bots and keep sending out uh, little surveys or individual questions to keep fleshing out their profile. Um, and the longer they hang out, the deeper a profile that you build. Uh, so that's what I mean by it, like dripping a few questions over time. And a real a real basic uh, question that is is 
sometimes not easy to grasp even for the person is what would you like to do? You know, why, why did you show up here? And some people have a project in mind. Some people have things they want to learn, but that's golden right there because that's how you engage with a person is by uh, as much as possible f helping them get what they want uh, while at the same time they can use their energy to serve the community. Um, any other thoughts or comments on profiling, profile questions, maintaining a database of users? Yeah, we had a question come in through the chat from Rather Mercurial. Um, it asks, what about setting expectations around workload, comps, and deliverables? Should that be tackled during onboarding or later? I've seen a lot of work groups lay down tools or simply dissolve due to the unclear expectations creating immense conflict, even within the first season. Excellent. Yes, this is huge. Uh, yes, expectations should be a part of onboarding because you're funneling people into, um, into their track, right? And so if somebody is on a contributor track, they are going to be interested in, in compensation and time commitments. And that's an axis right there that categorizes most people. Um, as much as I've done like really like ivory tower kind of thinking on, on like profiling contributors, really it's the time commitment and the experience they have and the compensation they need are the, are the three biggies. Um, and so yeah, setting expectations uh, is part of the onboarding process. Definitely part of um, orientation. You know, here's, here's your path if you are interested in contributing, being a, you know, a compensated contributor. You know, not just casual. So yeah, good question. And did I answer that good enough? I think so. Absolutely, um, thank you. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Um, so Discord, this kind of a structural thing, you know, the, the start here, like some people want like an automated um, process for getting on, like they aren't ready to start um, uh, con you know, talking with a lot of people or maybe like talking with people seems like a big commitment <laughs> and, um, you know, like some people are just here to watch and kind of see if they're interested. So it's a good idea to have that Discord start here as a kind of a self-guided onboarding option and um, to include not only text but also videos so that people that are more visual or audio oriented can uh, learn that way. Um, and do we still have like the series of videos that Avi made to uh, for Wonder? Yeah. 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 Um, so having having real keep them really short. You know, the, again, just like a minute long um, videos for each topic is is manageable. And then of course rules and the intro, the official links, which will have your server map on it, and uh, and FAQs. And if you're doing some sort of role gating, token gating, and you know, it's it, it's good to have access to all of the start here, and then what kind of community you are, you know, the the product, the information, you know, community call channel and FAQ channels, all of that accessible without having to jump through a lot of hoops because you're going to have people just jumping in because they want product support or want to check things out and and they should be able to do that without much friction. Um, but beyond that, we definitely want to encourage introductions. Um, the intro channel in organizations that have it, if you go look at it, and, and if you're really encouraging people to use it, like actively call it out, you know, as soon as people like drop in some random channel and say, hi guys, you know, you, you immediately kind of like shuffle them over there. It's like, go make an intro, you know, and then then we can we can engage more because we'll know who you are, um, and those those channels are where the community people should be like um, sort of like harvesting uh, um, potential contributors and and just guiding people from that. That's a very valuable channel. And then uh, the other factor that comes up a lot is quick human response. Uh, I know that like not everybody wants to come in and talk to people right away, but if somebody does post something getting a, a pretty immediate um, feedback, even if it's just a, a thumbs up that, hey, we saw you. Hello, fellow human. We're humans here too. Um, 
people again and again in the other servers that uh, I've been in have mentioned how uh, welcoming and comforting that is. Uh, and we've all had the experience of dropping a, a message, asking a question in a forum or something, and like a day later, two days later, still nothing. It's, it's kind of heartbreaking. Um, so yeah, just anything you can do to have a, a quick human response is going to uh, is going to be very welcoming. Any other thoughts on the on sort of like the automated portion? Absolutely, agreed. And that quick human response doesn't have to come from like you know a community manager or I mean that's that's a that's an excellent role to hand off to uh, more casual community contributors. Like, 12 of them that understand the importance of that and are you know competing with each other to to give someone the first thumbs up on their intro uh then that that will however you want to incentivize that you know free ice cream sandwiches or something uh will will definitely keep that going at a low cost um, to the organization and that's a role some people want just to be the 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 door person come on it's nice okay so an optional educational flow um, for for Orca, we were since since there's a lot of corporate and Web two people coming in that you know they're they're looking to essentially do a, a similar job in in Web three, and they they may they they may be pretty fresh they may be pretty fresh to Web three, um, and so having um, some optional educational stuff around. Uh, even like getting a getting a wallet, or uh, explain your ecosystem or the ETH ecosystem, and you know just everything that I have here. You know how to use EtherScan, uh, what the heck are ENS domains, and what's the big deal about them. Um, for um, for Orca, we had in there you know basically like applications of pods, and uh, you know what's a Gnosis safe and and why are they important, and so these you know again optional. People can get a little PO app or something if they complete them, but uh, just so that if someone coming into your organization is is really new to Web3 and needs those things, you don't necessarily have to send them away to get it. You know, it can be part of the part of the same onboarding package, uh, but definitely keeping it optional because it'll it'll just make some people cringe that uh, you know why do I have to go through this? It's kind of like when the uh, when the government mails you a form uh, asking you for your mailing address, and, and it's like head smack, um, you don't want to do that to people. So uh, that's why it's optional. Uh, any any thoughts on an optional educational flow? I didn't spend much time on it because it seems kind of obvious. Yeah. And just because you don't want to send them away doesn't mean you can't use other people's material. I mean, you know, that's composability. You can find ways to uh, embed it in your um, whatever tool you're using. So community calls and office hours, um, you know, here's here's where you can have some. Sometimes it's the first human contact, but this is like the rich human contact, right? People actually get to talk both ways, uh, and they can ask questions about the organization. Um, and a couple things, you know, I'll get into a little bit of how running community calls ties into that. You know, having shout outs for your contributors and partners kind of gets the new people excited about like, okay, you know, people get recognized for, for what they're doing here. And, um, and of course, giving updates about the organization or, or team level, pod level activities kind of gives people um, a, an idea of what's happening in the organization so they can start funneling down as to where they're going to focus their efforts and it's also a time to put out a request for contributors and a request for proposals i'll kind of group those together so you're asking for bigger engagement right there uh, again you know getting people interested getting them hooked in and then intros if it's a small group and there's two or three new people in there it's pretty great to give them a chance to to do their intro in the group if they want um, certainly uh, optional and some people might be a little shy about coming into um, to a room full of people that seem like they all know each other and are smarter than you and everything else. <laughs> and then, but that's not really the case. We're all just, you know, here learning together and equally anonymous. Um, so yeah, those office hours, great chance for 
new members to maybe meet another member or ask those questions and hopefully keeping it chill it's like a real low pressure uh, situation yeah and the and the office hours there's there's really no cost to setting that up i mean it, it's it's only people time if people show up and if people shows up you're getting work done and if they don't show up you're getting work done you know it's it's fine uh so i encourage everybody to just just throw it on the calendar see what happens okay ah this is the big one um this is what I am most excited about and really enjoyed the heck out of facilitating um, are these one-on-one uh, -on -one calls are a little less interesting and you already know what that's about. You know, you just grab a time and, and answer all their questions and encourage them along. But the cohort calls, this, this is a party, this is a jam. Um, if you, yeah, I, I recommend having one or two uh, people from the community side, experienced mentors in it. Um, we tested two sessions one week apart and there was you know there was async work i'm experimenting with a six week one right now uh format i'm, I'm sketching out um the relationship building between the people that participate is what's going to keep them there it's what's going to spark teams i can't emphasize enough how valuable this process is for getting contributors engaged getting them to stick around, getting them to actually be productive. Um, so we do a little bit of relationship building just uh, in terms of like uh, introductions. And then, you know, we actually start working on some of the projects of the DAO. They wouldn't have to be. You could just go pull anything off of any bounty board. But I would recommend any of the participation sections. I would recommend that you have like a writing and analysis type project and maybe a design and artsy oriented project so that um, the people that fall roughly into those categories will each have some place to shine on that. And so um, uh, that can be like uh, doing a governance analysis of another organization. It can be writing a proposal for a Gitcoin grant um some of the design things uh last time i used uh designing a twitter card for a space coming up um things like that so that people have some actual hands-on participation some feeling of success like hey cool i'm enjoying this work and in this process you're getting to teach them how your teams work what sort of like governance or consent at the team level that you use and what tools that you use like i'm i'm running these things in figma uh any of those whiteboard type things would work um but if you have different tools that you use it might be good to uh, have some of that work happen hands-on with different tools um so that's huge between those two things the relationship building and the actual participation that happens in a cohort uh is is so valuable and, and this is also a chance to do an orientation, uh, again, just kind of reviewing the channels and where to find docs and um, just finding their way around. This is also a chance for more profile building. Now that you're getting to know these people a little more, you're getting to observe their uh, work style. You're gonna maybe see some of their strengths and weaknesses. I mean, you're, you're meeting them live for two sessions, but there's also all the async chat back and forth because um, you have these guys keep working on whatever those projects were. Um, they can have their own little channel in Discord and really just be a, a working team for this this week or two while they're while they're figuring out, you know, getting their feet wet in your organization. Um, so I love this, John. Yeah. I love this cohort idea. Ed and I kind of had. Um, we were ideating on like a similar thing. We were calling the assembly, which huh. uh, we're kind of shelving for right now. But I, I'm so excited to like get back on that and have these cohorts and get to know people and work on projects together. It's super fun. Let's do it. So, and you know, the, all these things are, are are changing so fast. Like I, I can I can see in the near future what's going to happen for Wonderverse is, uh, you know, when the next X million people come on 
Uh, I don't know if it'll be this year or if it'll be the next bull market when we're making the news again. But sometime in the next three years, one million people are going to join your Discord in one day. And if you don't have the, the community there um, geared up to support them, it's going to be chaos. Um, and that's going to happen to every protocol, every tool. And uh, we need to be building for that now. And that's why um, thinking about these structures. Yeah, yeah. So so your community is going to be your, your ambassadors, your navigators, your orientators, your educators. And um, you can't scale up fast enough to, to hit that without uh, having a community at hand. So I think that's kind of where we're going the next know one to three years who knows how long um okay lost track there <laughs> uh, but the cohorts do it figure out a way to do it it's it's a cheap experiment to at least try just round up five to ten of your newest people and jam together even with not much agenda uh and really see what happens um and yeah we i, I had talked with john and ed about how to integrate such a thing and um, one of the things i was thinking about using the wonder platform would be like you can set up an open bounty uh, that's sort of like the automated portion of the onboarding and then they get uh, an nft that unlocks them being able to sign up for the cohort and then you know and then the cohorts if they're regularly scheduled or if they just come up whenever enough people are interested um, then that process can happen. So there can be this like automated funnel through through the Wonder app uh, again, so that people don't really have to leave um, leave the main tool that you're using there. And then you've got all that great discovery function that Wonder brings also. Okay, enough of that. Matchmaking, uh, obvious, but incredibly valuable thing. I mean, this is this is the reason that people are showing up in Web3. This is the reason they're showing up at your Discord uh, is because there's they have something in mind. They either want to contribute in some specific way or they have a proposal floating in their head um, or, or they're just looking to do certain kind of work, design work or whatever it is. And so, you know, this process of onboarding them, getting to know them a little bit, and then being able to um, to play matchmaker and get them connected to, to the people and projects and teams uh, is a huge value add because even with everything else, they're still standing there and like having to like knock on doors to go into the room where everybody knows each other. And, and you know, a matchmaker can be that warm introduction of like, hey, I've been working, I've been working with Kim for a week and, and I think y'all would be great partners on the community team here, here she is, you know, that sort of thing uh, feels a lot better than uh, just saying, okay, yeah, go to that pod meeting. See you later. Um, and even external projects, um, something that I've observed in the past year is that, uh, you know, you might have a lot of interaction with somebody over like, uh, whether it's a week or a couple months, and then they disappear it's because they went off to go do another project and then when you ping them again there's opportunities there either for you as an individual or for your organization whatever you know product tool service that you're that you're selling um, so don't think of it as a loss if somebody goes through your onboarding process and then immediately you know goes contributing to another organization they're going to remember you fondly um, and that relationship could pay off in the future too How's that for like, you know, woo woo long term thinking, you know? Yeah. Um, so all of this sort of distills down to like having a clear pathway for any person hitting your organization. I use the word persona because I think of like stakeholders and their different needs and, and uh, persona, but helping anybody find what they want to do and then getting that human contact early and keeping it regular. Um, if you can, if you can do those two things, you'll be, you'll be the the, the top twenty percent of of digital organizations as far as you know contributor satisfaction, um, and and just being able to onboard. Uh, 
and 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 if you do everything that we've been jamming about today then you'll get love notes from people like like we did at orca you know who just were just like amazed at the onboarding process overall so which has all been revamped i wish i could show it to you but now they pivoted and long story short most of that stuff has changed because they aren't really onboarding contributors they're product focused and which is one of those evolutions that can happen. Um, I'm going to hang around to, as long as people want to talk about these things, uh, but I just wanted to put it out there that if, if, if these ideas are stimulating to you and you're excited about it, I do have a, a Figma that I can share a copy where you can kind of go through this process and play with it. And um, my Calendly is down there. If you want to talk one-on-one -on -one later, you can um, grab a time. And Thank you so much. Right. Yeah. Uh, thanks, for the, uh, <laughs> thanks for the opportunity to blab about something that uh, I've really, really enjoyed this this past several months building and and facilitating this and um, got a helping a couple other organizations um, uh, like Affiliate DAO and uh, a little bit reluctantly Woo DAO, but I'll get them um, to to install these systems. So. I mean, everything here to me was true. I think, John, you're an example of one of the things you were talking about in your matchmaking slide of, uh, you know, you meet people and then they leave and they and then they come back and do something. I think John was here in the Wonderverse community before I became part of the core team. And, you know, I would see John in all of our community calls and then, you know, things kind of simmered down. John was doing a lot of work over at Metropolis, Orca, now Metropolis. And then here you are again, uh, actively contributing to the wonder and our community. Love to see it. Yeah, that's how that's how it works in Web3 in theory. And uh, now let's see if we can keep it going. Again, for the workshop. <laughs> and Ms. Jim, I saw your message asking for my work credentials. I saw it on my mobile. As soon as I get to my laptop, I'll send you my work copy. And thank you, everything you said is amazing. Thank you, John. And I'm sorry. Thank you. No, 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 sorry. You're good. Come on anytime. Ask lots of questions. And I'm also interested in hearing um, what other projects people are um, contributing to and uh, what sort of challenges that they're having. Um, onboarding wise or 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 otherwise um everything tangents to onboarding so you know, whatever i think i saw a rather mercurial um unmute i just wanted to give them a chance oh, i'm good go ahead Ed. it's fine all right i i don't mean to be a downer or two in the weeds or anything um but i was kind of circling back around the the expectation setting issue i had I had jumped into the uh, Orca community call where they sort of spun down their community contributor program. Um, and and I've been in ex a similar experience over in Rabbit Hole. I was wondering if you had any advice as far as, it, um, as far as contributors go when contributing to more centralized projects where there is like a product team and external, you know, community contributors. Um, how can we foster better communication, set better expectations, and avoid situations like uh, maybe we've experienced in the past in other groups where uh, community contributor programs are spun down, uh, those functions are centralized, and there's no more contribution opportunities. Yes, this is a big one. And, um, you know, and it's wholly on the fault of the centralized entity, whether that's you know a, a corporate sponsor or whatever. Um, or and sometimes like dev teams are really strong in controlling in in what are supposed to be, you know, decentralized orgs. So I hear you. This is a very common issue, and yeah, it's it's really about. I think it's a two-way street too, though. Well, in 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 what way uh, can the community like I guess either demand more or take more ownership? like you know in in one case if if uh if a corporate sponsor is spinning down their community because they don't need contributors is there still some work to be done and could the entity actually just keep on by itself even without the corporate um backing um I think those are some possible solutions um we're still noodling out 
you know business uh, revenue models in Web3, and so that's another related challenge on how to sustain a, a DAO, especially if it's been supported um, as Orca was by Sonar Labs. And um, yeah, but I, I, I put that squarely on the sponsor to to really spell out, here's why we want a community, here's the expectations of it, expectations both ways. Like, you know, we'll, we'll fund you, we'll support you, but here's what we want, you know, in exchange for that. Um, it's very, very transactional way of doing it, but I think ultimately that's what it boils down to right now because we're not Web3 Utopia yet. I think we all have um, sort of a vision of getting there, but um, I don't know. I feel like I, I bounced around it, but I'm not quite sure if I nailed it there. Rather mercurial, and I'm happy to keep, if you have help, help me out with this, I'm happy to keep talking about I, it. I, th I think you hit the nail on the head there. Uh, you know, sometimes it feels kind of bad to be very transactional but i also think that really helps set clear expectations and keep uh uh you know a more workable working environment in general uh you know transactionality can help ease some tensions and get right to brass tacks so it's that, that's helpful thank you yeah but so yeah so taking the time to communicate um sometimes it can feel like it takes a lot of time, but uh, there is a payoff down the road in, uh, in everyone having realistic expectations and no hard feelings if things don't go well and that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah I, I agree with John on this one. I think, I mean, I do also believe it's a, it, there's a two-way street element there, but I think mostly it, it's on the or organization's end. Um, if the onboarding wasn't up to par, then you're not going to get contributors who are, you know, want to engage in that meaningful way. And then I think the other issue um, with, because I've seen I've seen more Web3 orgs centralizing their um, the way they're running things as well. So I think the main crux of this was that in the beginning, every, it was like a free for all. Everybody's welcome. So. Uh, definitely curation of your contributors and um, the expectations is what I feel can, you know, alleviate that thing, that, that structure. And um, we're definitely moving towards that, I think. The bear, mar the bear market kind of uh, let things simmer down and people are reevaluating, like, what's the best process to have contributors? And I think we're moving more towards the... Um, what John presented today. I hope so. And yeah, and just the amount of communication, uh, it, it will sort out a lot of that. Uh, go ahead, Mercurial. I was just thanking Jim for her input, or their input. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Any other thoughts on onboarding or tangent issues? I can tell you what I found. Um, and I, I, I was invited to uh, WooDAO, and they're like Woo Fi, Woo Network, Woo Everything, um, because you know they were they were just talking about they aren't getting quality proposals, they aren't getting quality contributors, and um, what I get when I when when I get there, what I see is um, uh, a really amazing dev team, and I'm sure that. They are all getting um, a decent paycheck, um, and then for some reason, they're like bounties and compensation tied to things like, uh, like, like a, a team lead role is um, like four hundred dollars a month or six hundred dollars a month or something. And, and 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 I literally heard, you know, I was telling them about the like building a cohort onboarding process, and I and I literally one of the devs was just like, well, how long is that going to take? Like a few hours? And it's like, um, no, <laughs> you know, it, it's just all this stuff. It community stuff takes time, and so, um, and and you know love the people that have that engineering side of the brain nailed down like uh, they can they can build all kinds of things and 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 some people are more people oriented and and we need a mix of both to make these projects fly and, uh, and people need to get paid uh, just a fundamental thing that just keeps coming up thanks for watching this community workshop replay 
Join us in Discord to participate in more live events and chat about all things Web3 and DAO creation.